started the PhD program together and shared, shared the same office. So I have a lot of fond memories with Thomas. And he had a reputation in school back then that whenever all the TAs got stuck uh, with a question and no one knew how to crack it, we would go to Thomas and he would solve it. So he was a <laughs> well, stand-in professor. I, I guess you guys never figured out that it was all wrong, what I was telling <laughs> no. you. But and, and, and the next thing I, I have to tell you is he's French. He's got a wicked French sense of humor. And he's extremely humble. It took me a lot of arm twisting to get him to come on stage. So this is a, an exceptionally miraculous event to have Thomas speaking in public. <laughs> yeah. so, so Thomas, you, you did your dissertation in decision analysis. Can you tell us what your dissertation was on? Sure. Um, so I actually had the pleasure of working on the value of hedging. One thing I had noticed is that uh, you know, we have great concepts in decision analysis, like the value of information, the value of control. But you know, hedging is also quite an important topic. You know, it's really about trying to engineer the moments of the probability distributions you're looking at. And so I, I did my dissertation work on that. I hope you won't ask me too many questions about the specific mathematical formulas, because I don't think I remember any of them at this point. No, but no, but that, it was a lot of fun to work on that topic. I think you get the idea. He's a, he, he's a complete geek. He can go to the mat. He, <laughs> he graduated from Ecole Polytechnique, in case and that should resolve all doubts. OK, so, so you also spent some time at SDG, and yep. you worked on full-blown decision analysis projects. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the projects you were on? Um, sure. So I think one uh, project, which may actually have been the first I worked on, um, the way that it started was there was an electric utility in the US that was considering building an, uh, a nuclear plant. That was many years ago, back when people were talking about potentially a nuclear renaissance in the US. Um, and so initially, they hired SDG, and they hired us to look into how to manage the construction risk, the timeline, and you know, avoid this becoming like a, a financial black mark on the company. What was interesting is, like most decision analyses, we figured out after six months that it was the wrong set of questions to ask. So after about six months, we realized that the real decision should be about whether to build the plant or not, as opposed to how to like, manage the construction risk. And they, they also had a big decision that they had ignored so far in terms of what technology to use. And so we actually did um, a pretty good survey of like, what technologies were available, what were the, dif the different constructors and partners like in terms of experience working with them. And uh, you know, we figured out that you know, it was a good idea to talk to each of them individually to figure out what the strengths and the weaknesses were. Um, so like many decision analyses, I think it's uh, mostly a story of taking detours to finally get to uh, the right frame and the right answer. So Thomas, from, from that background, how, how did you get into Google? A hiring mistake, I think, is my most probable uh, explanation. I mean, the, <laughs> it actually took a few, um, a few twists and turns. I first joined Google to do something fairly different from uh, decision analysis. I actually managed the data science and analytics team for a couple of years. Um, and that's actually when I started learning more about data science and finding it quite interesting. And then after two years, what happened is that my, my manager at the time left to become a product manager within Google Cloud. That was like four years ago. Back then, Google Cloud was like much smaller than it is today. It was a bit of a side gig for Google. Not many people were working there. And um, he told me, you know, this looks interesting, and there happens to be like a position open over in pricing. Maybe you'd enjoy it. And so I applied, and I got in. And after a couple of years, I started running the team. Um, and so it's, it's been very interesting. I think like most of the good things that happen in life, they tend to happen by serendipity as opposed to like conscious decision and efforts. And that's a good example of that. And can, you, can you tell us what's it like working at Google? Uh, fun and chaotic. Um, uh, I'm sure that you know, many of you, um, you know, have heard about um, you know, what the culture is like at Google. I would say um, there's a big emphasis on making sure that people work together very cross-functionally. Like one of the key elements of the culture at Google, which is very different, by the way, from what you usually learn in decision analysis, is that we almost never have a single decision maker. We really like to make decisions in a very cross-functional way. So for example, for Google Cloud, the way we make decisions on pricing at the end of the day is we have a committee which I chair, and we have you know, the VPs of engineering, the VPs of sales, the VPs of marketing, and of finance who are relevant for these products sit with me and making decisions together. 
So you know, we really want to make sure that there's no surprises, everyone is fully aligned on the strategy and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and that, that's quite different. You know, it sometimes means that decisions can take a bit longer, uh, but you avoid surprises and you avoid people uh, not knowing what's really going on in terms of product roadmaps and pricing strategy. So, so this morning, we have been hearing these conversations on how the two worlds of data science and decision analysis can collaborate. And, and you've kind of lived in both worlds for significant periods of time. So I'm curious, when you walked into Google, and they, they were, of course, before you became the head of pricing, they were doing some pricing. So I'm willing to bet that they were not thinking in terms of alternatives and preferences. So how were they framing the pricing problem before you came in? So what was interesting was that uh, pricing before I joined was mostly considered to be a product management function. So we literally had product managers making the pricing decisions. Um, and you know, product managers are great. You know, they, they're very technical, they're very analytical, they understand the business, they understand the market landscape and the competition. The one thing that we noticed, and I think the reason why we wanted to create a central pricing team was that Google Cloud is a platform. You have you know, 30 different products on it. You have, as of today, we have 12,000 different SKUs and resources. And if you let each product manager set pricing and the pricing strategy for his product, you'll end up with a mess. It will be completely inconsistent. You know, we won't have the same constructs and principles across all of the different products. And that's really one of the, the key reasons why we ended up creating this central pricing function. And, but before you brought in your thinking to it, how were they thinking of it? I think it was mostly focused on adoption, to be honest. Um, because you know, back then, the industry was really in the land grab kind of mode. And so a lot of the product managers were optimizing for like, what is the lowest that we can charge and that we can kind of get away with? Um, I do think that we realized uh, very quickly that this has some limitations. So for example, uh, cloud is a bit of a funny space in one way. It's a business that is both B2C and B2B. Like you have some people who buy cloud services who are hobbyists or very small companies. And then you have some who are enterprises. <laughs> You know, like Walmart, Coca-Cola, and so on and so forth. And it doesn't really help you to be way cheaper in terms of public pricing with the B2B customers because they expect discounts. And so if, if you start from a very, very low list price and public price, and then they come to you and they're like, you know, I want my 15%, you know, 20%, 30% discount, you know, you can't tell them, sorry, I can't give that to you because the people across the table from you, the procurement people, they're compensated based on how much of a discount they extract from you. And so I think that's when we started realizing that you know, we should probably change the pricing strategy, and that's one of the key things that uh, you know, we did in the early days. So can you share a little bit about how a typical decision analyst would look at the pricing problem? So I think you know, there's two aspects again. Um, I would say there's one aspect which is very decision an analysis-like. Uh, you will have a lot of decisions that you make that are not repeatable. When you're negotiating with a large customer who's going to spend like hundreds of millions of dollars on your platform, it's a one-time decision. They will have workloads that no other customer has, or at least no other customer is running quite the same way, and you don't get a do-over. Like if you screw up in that negotiation, if you give something you shouldn't, there's no do-over. Like you will have to live with that for the next many, many years. On the other end of the spectrum, you have this like mass of like hundreds of thousands and millions of online customers uh, who make very small purchases, but you can really apply data science to learn what they like, what they don't like, how they're using the, how they're using the products, and you can try things like experimentation. Um, and so what you need to do is, when you're running a, a pricing team for like a, a product like this, which has both of these sides, you need to be able to leverage the best of decision analysis for the large customers and uh, data science for the larger mass of the smaller customers. So you've kind of, you're describing some sort of a magic middle ground that you've, you've kind of broken up the, the large customers and the small customers, and it all makes sense. But I wonder how, how does Google describe the problem that you're solving? I, I doubt that they would call, do they call this a decision problem? Or uh, a I've never problem? seen anyone outside of this room calling anything a decision problem, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, Usually, I, I hear a lot of people who come to me and say, like, I have a product strategy problem, or I have a pricing problem, or I have a marketing problem. And all of these are fine decision problems. But 
I think it takes a certain level of abstraction to recognize that all of these share some characteristics and all of these are decision problems. Um, and so I think it kind of behooves us as a community to make sure that we speak the language of the people who need our help and we don't go to them and try to convince them that they have a decision problem, like, because that's not the way they think about it. So, so what are the ways in which they describe the problem? Like, what, what are the questions they're asking? So what's very interesting is, um, I think most of the time they're not even asking questions. Like the, the typical meeting that I see happening a lot is they come to you and they're like, I'm trying to do X and I want your approval. And I, I, mean, I hear a lot of people like chuckling and saying, yes, this happens a lot. And that's usually like the, the best recipe for having a terrible meeting with me is you come to me and you say, I want to do X and I want your approval. Because I, I, mean, I usually want to start from like, What's the problem that you're trying to solve? And show me the data showing that this is actually a problem. And this is like one of the big strengths, I think, of, um, of decision analysis in data science is being able to look at the data in a kind of objective way to figure out if there's really an issue here or not. You wouldn't believe the number of times that you know, people think something is true, but it's actually not. Like they have an impression, they extrapolate from anecdotes. You know, it's, it's all very human tendencies, but uh, you know, very often they turn out to be wrong. So I want to start the meeting that way. I want to start with what you would probably call a framing or a structuring conversation in decision analysis parlance. I want to understand what the problem is and why it really is a problem. And then we can start jumping into how can we solve it. So I'm going to switch tracks a little bit. So you've, you've been a decision analyst, both in the PhD program and, and, and SDG. So that's a very different culture. And now you're at Google, which is, again, a very different culture, very steeped in data. So what blind spots do you see that our community has that we need to think about from, from the data science perspective? Um, that's a good question. I would say it mostly has to do with, um, in decision analysis, we speak a lot about values and preferences and information as like, you know, the key components of making a decision, which all makes sense. I don't think we really equip people with how to deal with information. And you know, I think this is one area where I think we could do better as a community. Like, for example, we don't tell you what to do if you have like, this gigantic table with like, millions of rows and like, dozens and dozens of fields. We don't tell you how to get started. We don't tell you how to clean up the data. We don't tell you how to do what a data scientist would call an exploratory analysis, you know, to interrogate the data and try to understand like, what may be going on here. I think these are like, things that you know, we could really benefit from. The, the flip side of it, of course, is that you know, data science um, you know, sometimes could learn a few things from decision analysis, especially framing. Like very often, you'll see a data scientist who did exploratory analysis and started with some preliminary hypotheses, but never really bothered checking in with anyone else to check if that was actually the problem we were trying to solve or if it actually made sense to spend time on it. And so you, you want to make sure that you bring both perspectives to the table um, so that you're, you're really addressing the right problem and with the right set of information. By the way, if you have any questions that are forming in your mind, please submit them. We'll add them into the mix. So <coughs> earlier this morning, we had a question that Cassie addressed, which, and this is a very common question in our community that, hey, uncertainty doesn't exist in a database. And Cassie had a very interesting point of view that, wait a second, you are going to form your opinion about uncertainty from the data, and that's where you need to look for data. Yep. I wonder what your reflections are on that. I think it's also very true. Like, um, I think in classical decision analysis, you know, we tend to pay a lot of attention to information, but I think the default framework is that you're going to get your information from a subject matter expert, which can be true sometimes, but it's not always going to be true. Like, there, there will be cases where um, you, know, you don't have a subject matter expert at hand or not someone who knows about this, and so you need to be able to get it from somewhere else for example, data. Um, the other thing I would say that I've learned a lot over the last few years is that experts are often wrong, like much more than they care to admit. Um, like, and data is the great unifier. Like it's, it's the one way that even junior people can have a discussion and an argument with a VP and win and carry the day because they have the data that shows that they're correct. And uh, so th that's why I think it's very important to make sure that we do this the right way. So when you and I have been talking prior, you know, in preparation for this conversation, you, you would tell me that one of the things you do really well is you make decisions. And, and you're, especially when there isn't enough data, when, there is, when people get stuck, 
So can you talk a little bit about that? Why, would other, why do other people get stuck and how do you do things differently and, and how do you trace it to your conditioning? Um, so the way I think about it sometimes is that decision analysis is a bit like Zen Buddhism. It really teaches you how to be at peace with the fact that you don't know everything and it's okay. Like, I, that's really what it's about. I think that there's a quote that I remember, I think it's by Thucydides, that basically said, um, the secret of happiness is freedom and the secret of freedom is courage. I think decision analysis kind of teaches you that. It's like, of course there's like, you know, tens and tens of uncertainties in there. Like the outcome could be bad, the outcome could be good, but it's fine, like I have a certain time frame to make a decision and I'm gonna make the best decision I can and then I'll live with the consequences and I'll deal with the consequences as they arise. And that, that's something that I find very liberating um, and that I often see in people who have studied decision analysis, but I almost never see in people who have only ever done data science and they often get stuck in this like mode of, I don't know enough, so I can't decide. And even though I have a certain time frame, I'm going to like, try to extend the time frame and, and postpone and postpone and postpone. And that's actually not a good outcome in most cases. Like, I, I think you need to have that kind of peace of mind that you've done the best you could given what you knew and given the alternatives you had. Do you care to define what what do you mean by intuition? What, what role does intuition play in your decisions? Uh, my intuition is lousy, so you're probably asking the wrong person. But um, I, I've also noticed that like intuition, I don't know if it's that good for most people even. Like I've seen a number of cases where an executive or anyone had a hypothesis and we looked into it using data and it turned out to be completely wrong. Like one, uh, one that was kind of funny was um, in my first job at Google, um, you know, I once worked with a team that was running the call centers for all of Google consumer products. So this is basically the, the worldwide operation that picks up the phone or answers your emails when you have issues with like Chrome browser or like your Google phone or maps or search or anything like this. And uh, there was an executive who was running that operation and who had a, a view, a very strong hypothesis that the most tenured agents delivered better outcomes to the customers than the less tenured agents, which kind of makes sense intuitively, right? You would expect that you know, someone who's just been hired as a call center agent has only taken some training, um, minimal training. They won't be as good as someone who's been doing this for like many, many months. So because he had this hypothesis, we looked at it, and it turns out that he was only partially right. What we saw when we looked at it was that if you controlled for all the things you had to control for, like you know, the type of issue people were handling, the languages uh, in which the questions were posed, uh, you actually saw that people were getting better initially, and then they start, like the, the performance of the cohort was actually declining, which really puzzled us. Like you know, somewhere around 12 months, it started declining. And so we were like, this doesn't make any sense. Like why would people get worse over time? So we started looking at it a bit more closely, and what we realized is that the good agents were leaving. Because many, uh, in many cases, you know, it kind of makes sense in hindsight, uh, people don't want to be a call center agent for their entire career. And so oftentimes you'll have like, you know, people who just graduated who are going to be call center agents for a while while they find a better job somewhere else. And so what we were seeing was a cohort effect where you had people who were pretty good inherently. Um, they were ramping up in the job, but then they usually found something better after like 12 months and they started doing something else. Um, and so that's really what we saw. But you know, again, this was completely different from what anyone expected before we looked at the data. And if we hadn't looked at the data, we would probably still not know today. Um, we're doing good on time, so let's see. There are lots of good questions coming in. And they have to do with how you model pricing. So one question is, do you model the competitive dynamics of the cloud computing market? Uh, the answer is yes. So I would say, in, um, in general, when you think about pricing, you need to think about like a few different lenses that you can take, right? Like the, the three most basic lenses you can take are basing your price on your cost. So you can do something like evaluate your cost per unit and then add some premium to it based on what level of margin you're targeting. That's one way you can do it. Uh, the second way you can do it is you can do a competitive analysis, which would look at what is the performance of your product and the quality of your product versus the other things are available in the market, 
get a sense of the elasticity of demand with different price points. And then based on that, you can decide how aggressive you want to be in relation to the competition. The third framework is value-based. Uh, so it, this is more for cases in which you have a product that is somewhat unique and provides very differentiated value from anyone else. Um, and in that case, you may not want to even look at any substitutes or competitive alternatives because they're not really relevant. And you want to base it on the value that people actually derive from the, the product as they use it. Um, so these are like usually the, the three different frameworks. So competitive analysis is quite important in that respect. Um, I, I would add one thing, which is sometimes you need to ask yourself in your pricing strategy, am I trying to sell this product or am I trying to sell a different product through this product? Uh, so you know, in, in some cases, you actually want to have a product that's an enabler that allows you to sell more of a different product that may actually make more revenue and more margin for you. So, so just building up on that, how do you trade off revenue and uh, between revenue and prof profitability and any other business drivers? So the, um, you, you always have to look at the full picture of all of these different metrics. Like I think usually a good, one of the only good signs that you're doing pricing wrong is if you're only optimizing for one. Like if, if you're only ever looking at adoption or if you're only ever looking at revenue or if you're only ever looking at profitability, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, what you need to think about is like for different products that you have in your portfolio, what are you trying to do with each of them specifically and individually? And what are you trying to do as a cohesive whole? And you know, based on that, then you can adjust what you're trying to optimize for in each of the products. You should really look at the picture of all of these impacts on all of these metrics over a reasonable time frame. Um, and you know, make sure that you're OK with you know, what you're seeing in terms of these estimates. And so let's say you've done that. You've looked at all these different metrics. They have different implications. W would you say that ultimately it boils down to a question of who you want to be? Uh, to some extent. Uh, but you know you can't design these things in a vacuum. Right. Like there is a market out there. Uh, you know, cloud is still growing very fast, but it's an established market at this point, and so people have expectations. You you can't make your you can't make up your own rules and your own game. Right? Like for example, if we started uh, you know, decreasing prices on Google Cloud by 50% overnight, a lot of our resellers would be fairly pissed off, and they would have good reason to be, right? Because when you have an ecosystem of people who are reselling your product for you, if you cut your pricing a lot, that impacts not just you, but also them. And so you need to think about like, all of these different aspects. So would you say that the analysis, the thoughtful decision analysis on all of the different options allows you to have a more informed conversation on who you want to be, as opposed to deciding so. top down? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm getting some other questions, and, and they are they span different areas. So one, a top voted question here is, for you, what has been the most challenging aspect of transitioning from a decision professional role into a decision maker role? Uh, good question. I don't know if it's been that challenging because like, if you're a decision analyst, you know, in many cases, you, you start putting yourself in the shoes of the decision maker and you try thinking about like, what decision would I make if I were them? So I actually see it as like, almost not a transition. Um, I think what's more difficult is trying to explain to the people who bring information to you what you expect from them. Because usually if you're the decision analyst, you know, you're the person who's doing that job. And so now you need to, if you're the decision maker, you need to be the person coaching others on what they need to bring to you so that you can make like, the best and the most informed decision. It's often a bit difficult because you don't even realize how you do things anymore after a few years. And so it becomes difficult to verbalize to those people that you know, the reason I want X is that it helps me in the following way. OK. So I think a, a highly voted question here is asking you to give an example of how you apply DA to a pricing decision. And specifically, what DA tools do you use? Do you use decision trees with probabilities or strategy tables or something else? How did it work? And how did it enable a better decision? Um, Sure. So uh, one example I would think about is we had a negotiation with a large customer of Google Cloud. Um, it was a contract worth about $500 million over three years. And um, the way we, we had been negotiating for like a year, year and a half, we had had multiple meetings. We'd gotten pretty far. And it was down to like a list of five to 10 issues that we were still trying to negotiate between the customer and, and us. 
And we decided to do exactly what they decided to do to elect the new pope. We locked ourselves up in a room with the customer for two days <laughs> until white smoke came out. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but that was actually quite useful. So what we did in preparation for that conclave, uh, to call it that, is we actually created a model with like a very dynamic model of like all the different things we were discussing and what decisions we were okay with, what decisions would be very harmful to us, and what we thought it looked like from their perspective. And so that kind of allowed us to be very prepared with how far we were willing to go on different dimensions, and also really trying to understand from their perspective what were they going to care about most. Um, and that allowed us to make decisions on the fly. Like, you know, we had uh, decision trees and probabilities on, like, if we said this, what would they come back with? Um, and you know, it, it literally came down to the wire where we had like one remaining issue to resolve in five minutes. Um, the customer gave us a choice, like, you know, please give us this or give us that. And because we had already pre-modeled it and we knew how it would turn out, we knew exactly which one of the two to pick. So I think they were quite impressed, by the way, that we managed to decide in like 30 seconds when they gave us that choice. I think they thought that they should have asked for something else, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, this one, I think, um, this is an interesting question. How have you leveraged your position as the pricing strategy approver to promote a DA culture in your organization? And do you think your approach translates to the rest of us in other organizations? I, I think the key difference I'm seeing between people who've taken DA courses and who have been professionals in DA and others is thinking carefully about alternatives. Like, I see this happening so seldom in most organizations. Like. You know, people think in very binary terms most of the time. It's like, do this or don't do it. And there's actually like many, many ways of, of doing things. Like one question I often get is, you know, how do you know um, if you should increase prices in, in a product that you have in your portfolio? And usually what I respond back to people is increasing or, de or not increasing prices is a very binary decision and it's not that difficult. The difficult decision is if you increase prices, how do you do it? Like, how much heads up do you provide to your customers? Which customers do you go to first? How much validation do you want to get from the market? How do you inform your partners and your resellers? And how do you make sure that the effect in different markets is not completely out of whack with other markets? And so the how actually becomes much more important than do it or not do it. And you know, that's why you really need to think about your strategy and your alternatives very proactively. Like, it's not like a binary decision. And that's the biggest weakness that I see in people who haven't taken decision analysis. It's like they, they usually just approach things as very binary, and it's not. Like, you have many different ways of doing it. One, one interesting question here is if you, and you're sharing a lot of details about your thinking on pricing, sometimes some organizations might think this is their competitive advantage. Let's say you were to give a more detailed talk and you actually showed the methodology of how should you think about pricing. Do you think other cloud computing players would adopt your approaches? And why or why not? Um, well, first of all, I think everyone is you're applying the same kinds of principles. Like, I don't think any of the principles I've shared today are like a secret sauce for anybody. Um, and every cloud has a different strategy. So like, what you need to do is you need to figure out your strategy as a company and as a business. And then oftentimes, your pricing strategy is going to depend on that to a large extent. Like one thing that I often point out to people is, for example, if you haven't decided on your go-to-market strategy, it's probably premature to even think about your pricing strategy. Uh, so for example, in go-to-market, like if you decide to go direct and have a direct relationship with all of your customers versus going through distributors or resellers, that makes a huge difference in how you're going to price your products. And so if you haven't figured out those things, like your product strategy and your GTM strategy, it's probably quite pointless to invest a lot of time in, in uh, in the pricing strategy itself. And what you'll see if you look at the industry is each of the big three players, like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, have somewhat different product and uh, GTM strategies. The, the next few questions are a little bit more personal. So what is the common thread through all your diverse work? Hmm. Good question. I, if I had to put it in one word, I would say um, being a skeptic. Like, don't accept things for like what people tell you. Like, push back, challenge. And you'll often find out that you learn something, and the people that you're pushing back on will probably learn something too. So, 
So um, uh, that's probably one common thread of like decision analysis and uh, data science. It's like be a skeptic and don't accept things at face value. And the, uh, I think it was Feynman who said the easiest person to fool is yourself, right? Yeah. That's very true. What are you most optimistic about when you look ahead? Um, on this one, I would say I, I am very fortunate to be working in a, in a company and an industry where it's tough to say what it's going to look like six months from now. Like it's, it's still an industry that's changing a lot, growing a lot, and that's one of the reasons I've been fairly happy doing this job for like four years now. Um, it, it's almost impossible to predict what it's going to look like six months from now. There were times when we couldn't have known at that point in time that the kinds of decisions we were making would ever have been made. And that, I think that's going to be the nature of it. It feels like we have a new job, a new role every six months, even though we're staying in the same team and working on the same set of products. Okay, well, the next one, I, I, have, a, I have a suspicion of what you might say, but you've played so many roles. The question is, which ones have been the most fun? I think all of them have been fun. Yeah. Um, there's a time for everything, and you know, all of them are fun in very different ways. Like, um, I still look back with a lot of fondness at my consulting days, uh, meeting a lot of new people from a lot of different industries and companies, sometimes from different countries and cultures. Uh, that was quite you know, informative and a lot of fun. Um, managing an analytics and data science team was a lot of fun too. Uh, you know, being able to geek out, roll up your sleeves, code, that teaches you a lot. Um, and like, I think the last four years, going back to pricing, have interesting, interestingly been some kind of synthesis of the two, because you have um, you know, the strategy element of consulting and decision analysis, but you also have the rich data set and the data science aspect of my previous experience. So what advice would you have for this room where a lot of people, um, are, if they're interested in exploring opportunities in the data science world, how would, how should this community describe themselves to the data science world? So if we swing the decision stick, would we be unnecessarily limiting ourselves? Or is, it, is, there, or is there something about our identity that makes us really special? So There's definitely something very special. I think framing it as decisions, again, may be a bit limiting because people will not even know what you're talking about in most cases. Try to um, approach it from their viewpoint. Like, look into what area, what um, topic they're interested in, and then pick up on the decisions that you see in their work, and then show them that they actually have more choices than they realize. And they'll actually start seeing that, you know, you're quite helpful when you start doing that. Um, the other piece of advice I would have is uh, close Excel once in a while. <laughs> pick up new skills, like, you know, try Python, SQL languages. Um, you'll actually find it very rewarding. Um, and, you know, you'll start being able to access data and getting insights from the data um, that will make you very, very effective. So, so going one, one level deeper, do you think, what do you think are the characteristics of a data science oriented problem where decision analysts can shine? So for instance, um, Google AdWords, I'm thinking, doesn't really need a decision analyst, but in pricing, you do need one. Yeah. So, so do you have some thoughts on what are the characteristics of such problems. I would say it's mostly in cases where um, you don't just have a lot of data, but the nature of the problem itself is ambiguous. Because the, one of the key strengths of decision analysis is really the framing stage um, and not plunging in, going with the first decision that comes to mind. So I think if you have a problem space where you have rich data, but also a frame that is somewhat ambiguous, that's where the decision analysis um, piece is going to be very, very useful. Okay, um, last question for you. Is, is your team or do you think Google Cloud is hiring if you have such wonderful people in the audience? We, we are, uh, so we've got one position open right now in Seattle, a couple in the Bay Area and one in Singapore. So if people are interested, let me know. So okay, and you will hang around here for the rest of the day? I'll be around for at least another one or two hours, and then I need to head back to the airport. By the way, I just wanted to recognize that he came here. Um, his children are sick. They have the flu. But he came oh, here because okay. this <laughs> conversation matters to him. So yeah. thank you for coming. Thank you for having me.